this <laughs> hi i'm jody evans and i'm um the co-founder of code pink and also kind of birthed this whole notion of the local peace economy work and and i'm emily franco i'm the local peace economy coordinator at code pink um, and happy to have you all here and thank you for that for that update jody and um, just anyone who's new we'd love to know why you decided to join us today before you move into the meat of the matter Hey, Marcy. Marcy. <laughs> oh, you're muted, Marcy. You're muted. I'm Marcy Winograd. I volunteer with Code Pink. And uh, yes, I've been supportive of cooperatives and farmers markets for many, many years. But uh, after I heard Jody's and Emily's Code Pink radio episode on the peace economy, I thought, oh, this is hopeful. You know, this is inspiring and I can't be buried in all of this extractive, destructive uh, news 24 seven. It's gonna take its toll. I need to be strong and, and have something that nourishes me too. So I'm here tonight and I'm really happy to be with you. And we just put out a blast today to the central coast of California. Dolores is here, Dolores Howard from Paso Robles who's involved in uh, trying to preserve our coast, which could become the, nest, the West Coast capital of the military industrial complex if our uh, local, state, and federal lawmakers have their way. So uh, bravo for Code Pink for alerting everyone on the coast to this. Well, Marcy, maybe you can also put a link in the chat if people want to be engaged. That would be great. Thank you. All right, anybody else want to introduce themselves to the community that's new? Dolores. Hello everyone, nice to be here with you. I also was inspired um, by a session at the summer school, uh, Code Pink Summer School, where uh, Emily and Jody um, presented. And I just thought, I so wanna be a part of that. And I ordered the, the workbook. Um, I spend so much time on the computer and on devices that I wanted to have something that I could you know, hold in my hands. And I'm really excited to be here. Thank you so much. Anyone else want to unmute themselves and share? Monica. Sorry, my dog started barking just when it always happens. Bear, bear. Sorry. I'm Monica. If you have trouble hearing me, I can mute and come back. Um, bear. bear. Monica, we can hear you over the dog. It's no problem. Okay. Come here. I'm sorry. Okay. I um I got interested because I got um tired of just not doing nothing. And um I'm really worried um because I just don't see any hope right now for um I guess we're what's left and people like us of humanity. Um, I think we're in like the worst times. I'm 66 and I have never seen any times like this. And I've lived all over the USA. Um, most recently, I served with Clink and Haida in Alaska. And we, I saw some pretty bad stuff there with the tribes. But then I got here and since um, October 7th, I've been um, on LinkedIn and I, um, it's just like every single day, it's just tops itself with atrocities. And I'm just, you guys are famous and I really admire your work. Thanks, Monica. And you know, uh, we I talked about this a lot today while I've been at the RNC, and it's just when you see the global inequality, global climate change, fascism, and the AI, it's like those things are happening and no one is doing anything to stop them. So I call that our flood. And here we are, we have to build arcs to get through the flood. And if we can build a, a strong local peace economy, 
that will get us through this flood because the flood is coming. There is nothing that is happening that it's stopping the flood. And it's kind of like you say, you've never seen it worse. Well, it keeps getting worse, but nobody does anything to make it better except to double down on what makes it worse. So it's really being able to create that, you know, the only recognizable feature of hope is action. And so it's being able to engage yourself in the building of the local peace economy, which I think of as the arc that gets us through all of this, because if we can be connected, if we can learn how to be with each other and, you know, share and care, which which is endemic to us, which is how human beings have survived for millennia. It is the indigenous way. If we can, re, you know, <laughs> resuscitate those values, we'll get through this because, you know, hate and violence, they, they, they die because they don't create anything. We've just got to get through the messy part and be building the future together. So um, thank you for that. And there is the, the hope exists inside of us as we build a future instead of have our lives be used by something that's dying away. Um, and you know, it, it's, it's a messy when things are dying away. So we also have to just know that that's messy and not take it personally or make it the whole picture. Um, it's just a process. Anyone else want to share that's new? I don't know if I'm new or not. I can't remember. You can be new-ish. That's fine. <laughs> okay. Well, I just, uh, I guess I don't have much to say. I'm pretty discouraged right now, but. Um, I, I just I've, wanted, the question was, um, why did you decide to join us today? Well, partly because I'm discouraged and I think being with a community helps. Um, uh, yeah. Yep, that's what we hope to be. Um, we're uh, like the community that comes together every other week to help also be the tuning fork to what you're doing locally and creating that space for others too. So um, Emily, can you ground us today? Absolutely, yeah. So if you've been here before, you know we always ground in a piece of culture. Um, and if you haven't joined us before, now you know. It's um, As Jody always talks about, culture is really at the center of this work. It starts with culture. And so always ground in a piece from a culture worker. And tonight, just given everything going on and everything that has been going on and continues to go on, I'd also love to start just with a few grounding breaths together. That's something that you're open to. Um, <clears throat> I know I I I need it, and there's just been, as Jody was describing, a lot going on uh, within Code Pink, but also from the world since we've last met, as we all know, with the genocide in Palestine and the violence at home and here in the U.S. and um, that are deeply intertwined. Um, so yeah, we'll take a few three breaths together. Um, I like to put my hands on my body sometimes. Sometimes I put one on my chest, one on my belly sometimes one on my forehead. Lately, I've been feeling a lot, a lot, a lot in my solar plexus. So I'm gonna put my hands there today and just, let's just take a, an inhale together. And an exhale. Another inhale. And exhale. One more inhale. And maybe exhale through the mouth if that feels good. And this is a poem by Maya Stein called, It Looks Like the Sky is Coming Apart and Together at the Same Time. And the body is holding its losses like a fist and the fleshy hope is opening to an unprecedented vastness. And whatever we think we are leaving behind will keep insisting. And the things we desire will elude us. And our efforts will pose as failure. And we will not recognize how far we've come. And we will solve one problem and create another. And we will feel broken. And we will not be broken. And the silence will be deafening. And we will love destructively. And no one will appear to be listening. And there will be too many doors to choose from. And we will keep saying, I don't know how to do this. And we will be more capable than we ever imagined. 
and that poem will be shared out in the follow-up email and I'll, I'll put a link to it in the chat as well. But yeah, I think that really um, speaks to some of the discouragement and and heaviness that some of you named in terms of what brought you here tonight and and the, the arc of the peace economy um, as well. So pass it back to you, Jody. Thanks, Emily, and thank you. I mean, I think that's so important because we have been, at, you know, it's kind of like the two choices we have for president. It's like, it's neither, you know, it's 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 being able to imagine beyond the, the narrowness that we've been given for too long. And so by actually practicing the pivots that we've been doing, you literally are, you're taking yourself out of the violent past and creating a future. And it will be messy and it will like, what did we, you know, talk about this uh, the last week on our social media is, you know, learning how to just be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, here in um, Milwaukee, I met this guy who has a whole book uh, store called Discomfort. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's just getting back to discomfort is okay because the desire for comfort is killing people. It's killing us inside, but it's killing others because this demand of the empire and the comfort of, of those um, <laughs> that can buy the comfort is a violence. And so the the capacity for discomfort is, um, you know, that's so important. And also that um, when we're creating the future, it's going to surprise us what's inside of us, what we know, what we haven't used. I have to say over these years, that's been the most fascinating part of me is like when you do your little circles locally and you're talking in a group of like, well, let's address this or let's learn about this. It taps into part of your brains and your heart that haven't been accessed. And you start to discover how narrow of the world you've been living in. And I think if we look at the politics, you know, and we look at just now, it's just like, it's these narrow decision-making. It's like, where's the big story? Where's the big picture? Have we really shifted all conversation about politics into two crazy people for president? That's not a conversation. That doesn't teach us anything. That doesn't engage us in anything real. So I think, you know, by doing this, we are expanding ourselves. And that's where you get to the, you know, you get 10 years down the road and you go, oh my God, look at what we've been able to create because we're so used to nothing being created. We're so used to just like being in that hamster wheel. And so it's really the getting out of the hamster wheel that um, starts to just, I say, floss my brain um, into, you know, out of the hamster wheel and into possibilities that are always surprising me, which is one of my favorite parts about the peace economy. So um, I, I don't know if there's anyone here that wanted to share something that's happening for them locally, a question they brought to the community for what's happening or an excitement of something that's happening. If, if you want to share that before we move into uh, looking at our commitments from last time. All right. Well, I'm not seeing a hand, so I'm going to move forward. Oh, oh, Marcy. I'll just add to what I said before, and that is that I'm excited because we now have a core group of people on the central coast of California, which runs from Ventura up to Monterey. It's the rim of the Pacific, challenging what has gone unchallenged. And that is a plan to expand all sorts of bomb making, weapons development, commercial space, rockets for the rich, Elon Musk ozone depleting satellites and so forth. And we're gonna take it to other organizations. We now have a PowerPoint. We're submitting all sorts of public record act requests to find out who's who's paying what to fund this and uh, we're on our way. So I'm excited about that. <laughs> Community building and all, all the ways we can find ways to be together. Thank you. Well, so last time we talked about, let's make a commitment. And some of us are here that made commitments. And so Emily and I are gonna start out with our commitments and then we'll move to you to hear your stories. Um, and remember in making a commitment, it's that the rooting, the rooting ourselves into something. And it's, it's how I say, you know, if you're not rooted, they can use you. 
if you don't have the place that you're choosing from, which will create discomfort um, because you're going to be going against what everybody else needs from you, wants from you, whatever the madness is, but it's in grounding yourself in something. It allows you, first of all, to learn about the world because here I am rooted, here I stand, here's my commitment. You know, for me, it's, 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 you know, being in the world and just like, I am committed to peace. You know, it's like, I learned so much about the world. Um, and it teaches me so much because I'm, I have a viewing spot. Well, I said, you know, with my commitment that what I wanted to work on is that no matter what was happening, I was going to tell the truth in a room. And so no matter what was, what was, where it was, what was happening, I was going to tell my truth in the room, not like it was the truth, but my observation from where I stand. And it's been hard. <laughs> I've probably lost a few more friends, um, but it's also been super educational and I have to say liberating. Um, I want to talk about the liberation part of it because it's the most surprising part. I knew making that commitment was going to be a little uncomfortable, but I didn't understand how liberating it would be, like how free I would feel. So, um, you know, I had some very uncomfortable situations. I, I want to talk about one. I was a, I'm on the board of the Institute for Policy Studies, which is supposed to be this, you know, left progressive uh, institution. And we came to the board meeting and everybody was freaked out about the debate. And I was like, everybody went around and they were sharing their freaked outness. And so I was like, okay, what is my truth here is going to be really uncomfortable because it doesn't align with anyone. And I said, you know, this is also interesting because there's a genocide happening every day and you're freaked out about a stupid debate. Like I'm trying to understand. And it made everyone uncomfortable because I, it, it's not who they think any of them, who they think they are. I mean, I have to say, you know, Phyllis Bennis and, you know, Curry, they're like, we have great voices on Palestine in the community. But what I, what it helped me see was that Washington is really a performative space now. Even the people that mean to be doing well are performative because they try to say to me, oh, but don't you understand? You have to see the big picture. I'm like, no, I don't understand. <laughs> if you can see a genocide that's happening, like, I don't know what else there is because it affects everything. It is going to affect our future. If we can't stop this, everything, this is you know, you don't understand all the pieces this delivers to, but everybody was trying to be reasonable. And everybody, what I realized in that moment, like what it taught me, because it wasn't like, I wasn't worried it wasn't gonna teach them anything, but what it taught me, the thing I miss that it revealed was, wow, everyone in Washington is performative. Everyone in Washington is owned by a foundation or a think tank, you know, like, the, the money is the, their grounding comes from this money that, you know, like the frog in the, in the hot water kind of thing. It's like slowly, slowly, slowly you're fried, but you just didn't notice it happening because everybody was being nice and you got all like hurrah hurrahs and you were like coming to the metrics, you were delivering on the metrics, but Everybody is just delivering on metrics and there's no passion. There was no passion. There was no, I'm the crazy person in the room because I have a passion for life. I'm literally the wacky, crazy person who's sane. I mean, for me, I'm sane. I'm like, they're fighting for life and everybody's doing their job. And so it really revealed to me the theater because I, I don't, it, it's no judgment on anyone there being in the theater. It's just important for me to know that is the theater. And in that, I got this other real huge sense of liberation. And I don't know how to explain, I myself don't know what it's rooted in, but it was rooted in a disconnect from all of that. It was like, oh, I am not that. 
I can see it. And it like liberated me out of whatever still connective tissues I had there. And, um, and so it's been interesting because each person from the board has written since to try to have the conversation with me, either to rationalize their point of view or to, to say, I couldn't really hear what you were saying. So you must've been saying something important that I don't have down yet. And I wanna have that conversation with you. So the other thing about my commitment to speak the truth in the room was, I think I'm speaking truth in a room all the time and I realized that I'm not. And I realized how there are a lot of people who wanna be there and all they get fed is propaganda all day and it is not their fault. And it's, you know, that sense of it's not their fault. And really it's like, I'm here to serve the, the you know, the peace economy sense of caring, like really being able to be in that, you know, we're all human, we're in the soup together. There's a lot of toxicity. And how do I um, hold a rope up for you to climb out? Um, you know, so that um, it's like available, but that's your choice. You know, it doesn't become also my responsibility, which I think we talked about a few weeks ago, which was so also elevating for me. The whole sense of responsibility has transformed my life too. It's like, what are we actually responsible for is what's closest to us. And we get used by thinking we're responsible for something we don't even have our fingerprints on. So um, that was my experience of my commitment. I have a lot, to, it taught me a lot more, but I, I just wanted to share that one because it was, it really had so many layers and I felt in the end, this huge sense of liberation and love. I want to say just also love. It's scary time, but it's also- Thanks, Jody. Oof, powerful. Um. Yeah, I'll share a bit about my commitment and then we'll turn it over to you. I would love to hear from you. Um, so my commitment was to listen more deeply to my body, to the earth, and to the people that I'm with. Something I want to share before I dive more into that too is language that comes from Stacey Haynes and um, generative somatics. And and I think maybe also the Strozzi Institute, they do a lot of work in um, somatics um, for the sake of collective liberation, and they use the language of I am a commitment to, and there's something in that language for me that um, that shifts it slightly, and so I just wanted to offer that in case it's supportive of, um, of you and your commitments as well. I'm a commitment to, and then whatever, whatever you are committed to. So as I've been reflecting on what I've been learning from my commitment of listening um, more deeply, over the last month or so, the phrase listening amidst the noise keep, keeps coming to me. And I think Jody spoke to that um, tonight. And this is the noise that the war economy media trying to keep our attention surface level so we don't sense the deeper undercurrents of violence that are moving. And if we're tapped into those undercurrents, nothing, at least for me, that's happening right now, the violence, the oppression is actually surprising. But it's also the noise of my own thoughts that have been deeply conditioned by the war economy and continue to be conditioned into the war economy every single day. As Jody said, there's so much toxicity and it's all around us. And so yesterday I stumbled across this quote from Dr. Resma Menekin, um, who, who also offered that practice that Jody mentioned that was on our social media um, last week about a practice to, to kind of hone your ability to tolerate your discomfort. And he says, your body is a finely tuned and highly sensitive antenna, as well as a receiver and an amplifier. It naturally picks up on a wide variety of energy flows, then processes and amplifies them. And so Jody talks about this idea of being a tuning fork and here Resma and is talking about being a receiver. I think it's a similar idea. And I, I often think about my body as a receiver and my, goal is be, to become more sensitive to the frequencies I'm receiving. And that's something I've been exploring over this past month or so within this commitment, this listening with all of my senses that we talk about in the workbook. I think there's a question about that in the workbook, actually, about how can we listen with all of our senses. And I brought more curiosity to how I receive beyond the words and the thoughts and the noise. And when I allow my whole body to listen, how is it responding? Is there contraction? Is there expansion? Is there discomfort? There's so much discomfort. Is there even pain sometimes? 
Reverend Angel Kyoto Williams, along with Resma Menachem, um, who I just quoted, talks about how the systems of domination that we live in are able to maintain themselves in part because we are not in our bodies. The war economy tries to root out ways of knowing and sensing other than quote unquote rational thought at the cost of our embodied intuition and knowing. And again, I think Jody was speaking to that earlier. So that's not to say that my body is always correct in its response, just as my thoughts are not always correct, but it's still valuable information, especially when my body's response and my thoughts are seemingly contradictory. It's like kind of a sign to be like, okay, what's what's going on there? Kind of practice some discernment. Which brings me to perhaps the juiciest part of my learning over the last month, um, as the habitual conditioning of the war economy continues to try to pull me away from my intuition and my body's knowing, I've had to ask myself, do I trust what I'm hearing or seeing or sensing beyond the noise? And I think for me, at least, this is one of the most effective strategies of the war economy is to undermine our own trust in ourselves, that we're seeing what we're seeing, that we're sensing what we're sensing, and that we know what we need personally and collectively to be nourished and to thrive. And so over the last month, I've been reminded that a precondition of skillful listening for me is space. I can easily, so easily move into tunnel vision when there's a sense of needing to rush. And I've been playing with how I can create space first in my body with practices like just grip, taking some grounding breaths like we did at the beginning of this call, and then in my conversations and in my relationships to be able to listen more effectively. So in a way, this commitment has really brought me to the pivot of from rushing to wisdom. So this commitment is listening to listening has brought me to my next pivot to work with um, in the workbook. And the last thing I'd like to share is an orientation that I'm just starting to play with more intentionally. Um, as I've been traveling the last couple of weeks and interacting with people I don't typically interact with in my day to day, I notice, I've noticed that whether it's intentional or not, I'm often listening for what's what I think is quote unquote wrong or what I disagree with in my in interactions with them. And that is that is the war economy in me. It's the us versus them. So even though I'm trying not to listen to be right, this pattern is so deep within me and still rears its head. But a question came to me in this noticing. And that question is, what if I pivot to listening for where the love is? Where is the love behind what is being communicated, regardless of whether or not I agree? Can I start from that place? And what changes when I do? So I don't have any answers yet, and I'm just beginning this next turn around the spiral of this learning, but that's where this commitment to listening has carried me over the last month. And yeah, now I'll turn it to you. Oh, thank you, Emily. That's good. And I love the way it took you to your next pivot. So why don't we break into our breakouts now and you can share what happened on your commitment or maybe what your commitment will be after or any experience you have with a commitment. So um, I'm going to break into four groups of, let's see, I think we could get five groups out of this. Um, let's try um, and go to the breakout rooms and share either what happened in your commitment or um, if you haven't, if you didn't make one, um, what commitments you wanna have or how it's played out in your life. Um, let's see, so here we go. And Emily has written it down and we'll post it also. There, the rooms are open and you can join. If anyone needs help joining, just let us know. I see some smiles. <laughs> just a reminder to please mute as you come back. You might be unmuted from your conversation just so we minimize feedback. Cool. I guess we're back. So um, anyone would like to share what they learned, uh, what what happened in the in the breakout that you think everyone should know that surprised you or informed you in new ways? Any sharing or any personal sharing that you're for, for yourself that you're getting? 
because we learn from each other. Um, Dolores, and then Marcy. Oh, I was with two wonderful people, Dominic and uh, Sandy. And um, thank you to both of you for your sharing. Uh, Dominic shared about a performance that she does with um, with the bowls, a bowl of water um, representing tears. And it was just so beautiful. Um, she described how she how she struggled a bit with that, particularly when it came to Palestine. And, and Sandy spoke about um, the importance of civil disobedience and um, leaning into that commitment. And I, I so appreciate being with the both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Dolores. Yes, it's so lovely to be with humans and share our stories. Thank you. Marcy. Well, yeah, I was there with Tracy, and we had a lovely conversation, got to know each other. Tracy's in Brooklyn and listened, uh, you know, we listened to each other. And I uh, I feel like I cannot really produce more than what I'm doing right now. I'm pretty busy. But uh, what I do think I can do, and I'm not promising to do it next week, <laughs> is have a hard conversation. And by that, I mean, talk to someone I love, maybe not love, but have had a friendship with, uh, some sort of deeper relationship who disagrees about Palestine primarily. And try to have that, you know, I was always, I, I've always admired people who could have these conversations without getting upset. Because if you get upset, you don't really advance the argument and, and you alienate the other person. It's not persuasive. So uh, the question is how to make them feel heard and how to find some common ground and, and maybe ask a question that makes them think a little because you can't expect people to do a 180 because of one common conversation. You know, it's a, an evolutionary process. Yeah, it's finding that, well, I mean, it's kind of our role at Code Pink to be disarming because, and I, I wanna say here at the convention, um, we were were reminded yes again at like we dress up as billionaires and we have these signs on us. It's like I was the Israel lobby and Medea was the weapons industry and Tig was the oil companies and we have money and we're like buying you know like and in that conversation it's something that everybody agrees with, right? It's like everybody knows these lobbies own the politicians and so you found a place and you've made them laugh. And then you can have these conversations. And yesterday I was, Marcy had a conversation with a woman for 10 minutes who was wearing an Israeli flag. Oh, wow. So I think it's this, where's the starting place of like, I don't, I didn't come here for you to convince you of my place. I came here to have a conversation with you and learn from you in a funny way, opens up the conversation from them too. And, and how we can do that. And I, I mean, the funny thing here is, um, you know, all my family, my friends, the Code Pink team, Amarcy can attest to, was like, oh my God, everybody be careful at the RNC. <laughs> and they're just like, when we find a place of common ground where there's a bridge built, I feel like it's like they're having an orgasm. They're so happy that there's common ground. And so what is the common ground is that we don't wanna be separate. We wanna be connected as humanity. And so that, that I, coming home for the RMC, I'm gonna remember that, that inside of everyone is a heart that wants to be connected. And so where that connective tissue can then open up the rest of the conversation, because why people change disarming, <laughs> why people change their mind is through, the story, unpacking something they're holding on to that is very solid that they think is holding them together. And usually it isn't, I mean, Cesar Chavez taught me this, it's 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 the bank shot, it's not the straight shot, it's always the bank shot. And so what is that bank shot? And our most valuable things that could pink have been what I call the apple pie mo moment. It's when you can find that apple pie moment because everybody loves apple pie. Um, 
that's when you can start to find that connective tissue and get us all back to that we are all connected, that we all want peace and that war is the stupidest thing on the planet. You should have heard me with a reporter today. I was like, war? Only stupid people go to war. <laughs> so <laughs> it takes intelligence to sit down at a table and negotiate peace. And we've forgotten that. So um, all the things, Anita, <laughs> good signs. So we have one one more. I'd like to hear from one more before we hear some checkout messaging from Emily. Any Anyone else? Michelle. Me? This Michelle? Yes, you, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I guess I could piggyback a little off of what Marcy said, you know, about how she'd like to learn how to have that conversation. I was paired with Anita and we were talking about how we would like to learn civil disobedience, that we would like to have that courage to be doing what so many people at Code Pink do. Um, but, you know, it's like a skill set that has to be learned. But we're both going to the Gaza Summer School. So hopefully we can we can get that training and then get our groups of people so that we can we can uh, up our game a little bit. <laughs> but that's what so, we talked about. So where do you live? Um, where do you live, Michelle? I'm in Tucson. Tucson. And where do you live, Anita? Oh, San Diego. San oh, so are you at Code Pink San Diego then? Mm-hmm. Oh, cool. So, um, you know, I think it just takes practice like anything else. And you know how I talked about how liberated I felt after that, you know, it, it's funny. I, I see it happen to code pinkers that come, you know, and, oh, I could never go to Congress and do what you do. And then they do it better than us. You know, <laughs> there's an endorphin that is released when you stand. It's like, you know, when Mindy and I are depressed, we go into action, we go do civil disobedience for that endorphin to release so we can get out of our depression and remember who we are as humans. So mm -hmm. I also just think it's a medicine, um, the civil disobedience, because, you know, this system is so corrupt and so toxic that you have, you know, the same way I talk about flossing your brain, you kind of have to do it to remind yourself that that's not serious and that you are, you know, mm -hmm. it, to, to shift your viewpoint. And mm -hmm. so um, there, you you know, it's the summer, it's the Gaza summer school, August, you know, your elected officials are home. I want to say tonight in um, New York, they did a uh, intervention on Torres. Theater is the best. They got so many people to come out because it's theater. And so they, you know, it's like you've been indoctrinated by Israel. You've been owned by this like cult behavior. We're here to mm -hmm. free you and liberate you. And, and that theater, people love being part of it because it does feel more comfortable and more playful. And also, but it, it, it brings more people out and it's a, it's a, it's a fun form of, of civil disobedience. So um, I just suggest you, you know, work locally to, to get to your member of Congress this summer uh, they're home for August, six, you know, uh, so take advantage. And it's a great way also to build your local peace economy because, you know, local peace economy, we do the work of sharing and caring and building something together. And so having the two come together where it's political action and the, and the other engagements of feeding community, when they're really working well together, it's so nourishing in the community that builds this because you're, you're, you build by being passionately engaged and you build by taking care of each other. And the way I'm watching that across the country, is just so super beautiful. Um, so, uh, having them inter intertwine, making sure after action, there's also the sharing and caring and celebrating and joyful part. Um, so thank you. And, and um, I look forward to two more weeks and Emily, you can take us out. Thanks, Jody. And yeah, Amy, I just saw your message in the chat, which is about to respond, but all of the links will be in the follow-up email that will go out um, tomorrow. But just to say the names again, it was Dr. Resma Menekan, and also Reverend Angel Kyoto Williams, who I believe I mentioned earlier. But so yeah, I just wanted to um, give you all a few annou announcements. I'll put them in the chat as I talk about them. So our, just the first one will be, we can register for our next call. Typically we're on bi-weekly um, calls, but in the summer we um, are doing once a month. Um, oh, thank you, Jody. <laughs> um, yeah, you can hear I'm a little stuffed up tonight. <laughs> um, uh, 
yeah, our next call is August 14th, so you can register for it there, RSVP. Um, hope to see you there, especially, I know we have some new faces tonight. It's so great to have new folks in the call. And we we make these calls, we try to make these calls a place to connect and really um, a place of a lot of nourishment, as Jody talked about. Um, and next, I probably, I don't have time to um, show you the screen share um, for this, but you can add yourself to the local peace economy Padlet, and we, I can go over this more next time. That link will be in the email as well. But that way, um, it's a way to put yourself on a map, so we see who is where. It's a great way to just kind of feel the sense of community across the the Zoom sphere, but also see if there's anyone who's engaging in this work um, near you. Um, also, if you want to set up a time to talk through local peace economy ideas, you can email me. You have an idea of um, something you want to do in your community, but you could just use some support to flesh it out. Um, please reach out. Um, we have a list serve to, for people to continue to connect between calls. That's a little bit more personal. I know I've been trying to send some more like interesting um, blog posts and things that come through that I see that um, speak to a lot of the themes that we talk about here. So the link is there to join a list serve. And lastly, as Marcy mentioned, our last Code Pink radio show from last week was about the local peace economy. We had two phenomenal interviews, Caroline Woolard and Severin von Scharner Fleming. Um, so you can check that out um, at that link. It's also on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Um, and that's that's it for my announcements. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for being Peacemakers, thanks for making the world a better place. Um, thanks for your engagement. And Emily, blowing you healing blessings. I hope your COVID ends soon. And we'll see you in a few weeks. Spread peace. Spread love. Thank you all.